Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. My honor, I would, I would do, do my, my best to do, to do my, my duty, duty to, God to God and my country, and, and to obey the scout law, law to help other people at all times, times to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. And welcome to the Savage Nation. Now you know why those in the perverted media hate Donald Trump and the Boy Scouts together. Welcome to the show. It's very easy to fall for the propaganda being put out by Jake Tapper and company that Trump is crazy, Trump disrespected the Boy Scouts, Trump gave a tacky speech. It's very easy to believe this if you don't listen to the speech itself. It's very easy to fall into the propagandists that are out doing Lenny Reifenstahl right now in America. Look her up. Look her up, Wolfie. You're an expert on the subject. Wolf Blitzer, I invite you to study Lenny Reifenstahl. I realize you're not in the film business, but you're the equivalent in the talking business. You with your blinky eyes and your little white beard. Critics denounce Trump's tacky and disrespectful Boy Scout speech, says someone named Joe Taco Pino at the New York Post. And they're shocked that he gave an unbelievably tacky and disrespectful speech. They denounced it. They denounced Donald Trump for his speech at the uh, event in West Virginia. Even though the crowd cheered, and they chanted, we love Trump, and they booed when he mentioned the name of the, uh, let us say, crypto-Islamophile, uh, Barack Obama, the crowd booed. Well, they were horrified. They found three or four parents who were Democrats who were horrified at Trump's speech. They thought it was distasteful, and it discredited the Boy Scouts. And there were 40,000 young Boy Scouts at the 2017 National Boy Scout Jamboree, at which the president ripped apart the lying media and his Democratic opponents, and he elicited booze for his predecessor, the Islamophile, President Barry Hussein Obama. So I said to myself, what is with the speech that they're so going crazy over? What did he do? Well, we got the speech. And I listened to the speech, and I found the speech inspiring. And I'll play it for you in a few minutes, and you'll decide whether it was an appropriate speech or not for the Boy Scouts. But here are some other topics I'm going to talk about today. I read that the uh, North Korean madman is within two years of uh, an ICBM that could reach the United States and Europe, or let's say Russia. Should Trump strike North Korea before it is too late is a real good question, especially in light of the fact that yesterday I covered the film Dunkirk. We saw what capitulation led to. We saw what pacifism led to. We saw what liberalism led to. It was almost a defeat of the British Army. Is that what you want, a defeat of America? I know many of you do. I know many of you do want the defeat of America. Many of you grew up in the 60s where the motto was, bring it all down, man. Well, how would you fare if it was all brought down, man? You'd be eating your own toenail clippings. You'd be killing zoo animals for food. Be very careful what you wish for, you left-wing vermin. Do you have any crazy psychiatrist stories? I read that the Psychiatrist Association of some sort, another one of them, there's so many of them, the American Psychiatric Association, I think, filled with the craziest people on earth, which is why they went into the field to begin with, to try to figure out why they were nuts. Anyway, many of you go to shrinks, and they do some good work here and there, but inside they're just like you, probably a little worse, though. doesn't mean they can't guide you. Some of the craziest people on earth can be very good therapists. I recognize that. And they can help others, and in so doing, they help themselves. But anyway, the American Psychiatric Association or some such organization said that Trump is crazy, and they've changed their rules, and they're now allowed to comment on any public figure. Gee, I wonder who they were thinking about. It's a shame they didn't change the rules for Barry Hussein, the narcissist Obama, who I'm sure was crazy. In fact, we did many shows on his psychopathic behavior. He was clearly a psychopath. There's another story we're going to talk about. A California Muslim imam, yes, he has to be a Muslim to be an imam, sorry to use the M word, an imam in Davis, California called for the death of all Jews down to the last one of them in his mosque in Davis, California, and I'm asking Jerry Brown, 
I'm asking Moonbeam himself to step in. I want to know why that Muslim hate preacher is not deported from this country. Is that free speech? In a house of worship to get up and call for the death of someone from another religion? Down to the last person in that religion? And by the way, where are all the brave liars in the American Defamation League or the ADL? They seem to attack people like me at the drop of a pin. They have nothing ever negative to say about imams who call for the death of all Jews. Where are you, ADL, now that we need you? Where are all of you operationers? Where are you now? Then we're going to talk about other topics, by the way. I know you want to talk about Obamacare. I find it the most boring topic on earth. I leave that to the others who have no imagination and can't do anything else. But I'll touch on Obamacare for a minute. Are you aware that there are death panels in the Obamacare law? Do you know they actually exist? You saw the story of the little English boy whose parents wanted to come to America for an experimental operation to possibly save the little boy's life, right? It took the nanny state of England weeks to decide whether he could come or not, even though Trump extended this opportunity to this little boy to possibly save his life. The death panels in England took weeks to decide that he could come here, after which it was too late. Do you realize that such death panels now exist in American medicine because of Obama? And I'm mentioning this for a reason. The reason is that the rhinos are missing the greatest opportunity to put a stake in Obamacare, which is to sell it based upon the death panels, meaning their desire to get rid of it. Why are they not talking about the death panels and telling America what it really is all about? Why? Because they're stupid. If they had brains, they wouldn't be in politics, in plain English. The best and the brightest don't go into politics at any level, incidentally. They're either in science or in other fields. They're not in politics, I'm sorry to tell you. You keep looking for the best and brightest in politics, you're going to find yourself looking for a very long time. And you want to know why the media is filled with such hatred and stupidity? They are not the best and the brightest. Do you think Jake Tapper was at the head of his class in, in college? Do you think Jake Tapper had a choice to be a brain surgeon, an astronaut, or a liar on the, on the television set? He took what he could get. That's all. It's as simple as that. The best and brightest do not go into television news. They go into talk radio, if they're going to go into the media at all. I could have done other things, and I did. I've done many other things in my life, and some of them were pretty damn good. But eventually I found myself in the media to the benefit of America and the world. Let me tell you that. If that's a little egotistical, I apologize in advance. There's another story I'm going to talk about. The sperm count in Western men has plunged to a new low. Oh, yeah, hey, that's weird. Why is the sperm count of American men and Western men so low? Is it what Aristotle told us about, airs, waters, and places? Is it because our air is toxic? Because our drinking water is toxic? Is it because our food is full of toxins? Is it because the wallboard in our houses are toxic? Being made in China, most of the wallboard. The sheets we have. I bought a sweater for example, a few months ago in Park City, Utah. I paid a small fortune for it. It was gorgeous. Made in Italy. Couldn't resist it. Never buy anything fancy. I figured, what the heck? They can bury me in it. I bought this beautiful thing. It's still outgassing in my garage. Three months later, the formaldehyde won't go out of it. A stiffening agent. Lucky for me, I have a very sensitive sense of uh, uh, scent. My olfactory senses are very keen. I can't wear the thing. Tried woolite last week. It still don't work. It won't come out of it. You think that that stuff is not toxic on your body? How many of you don't understand that when you smell a, a person smelling of laundry soap, this laundry soap that you are smelling, that scent is toxic. The molecules that you're smelling have now entered your brain, did you know that, and your cells. If you can smell it, it means it's entered your body. It means the molecules that you are smelling have entered your brain and your body. I know it sounds frightening, but it's as toxic as uh, gas coming out of the back of a bus. Some of the chemical toxins in our society are absolutely carcinogenic. It's a well-known fact. So I'm not surprised when I read that the sperm counts are uh, very low in the West. Well, those are some of the topics. Oh, here's one other. May as well show you something else. Since I'm the idea man in radio, I don't get stuck on one topic for three years like Obamacare. Here's another topic. The Dems are now selling a new plan. It's called, uh, what's the deal they're selling? What's it called? What's Nancy calling it? They're giving it a new a new chain. They came up with a new phrase. Oh, better deal. Better. Nancy Pelosi is going to offer you a better deal. Charlie Schumer is going to offer you a better deal. 
It sounded too familiar to me, so I looked it up. I said, oh, yeah, wait a minute. FDR came to power. He was the last socialist president we had. Franklin Delano Roosevelt came to power uh, on, the, on the campaign slogan of New Deal. So they're now going back 80 years to come up with a new deal, and they're calling it a better deal? That's Nancy Pelosi. The New Deal was in place when she was still a little girl uh, in her mama's arms. And now she's selling us a better deal of what? More hatred? What is the better deal that the Democrats can sell us? Tell me what a better deal is that they're offering me. Which is more handouts for illegal immigrants? Washing the feet of illegal immigrants? That's a better deal, Nancy? What's the better deal you're offering? Higher taxation for men who work their, their, their hands off every day? That's a better deal for them? So you can give gold-plated immigrant services to illegal aliens who don't belong here in the first place, Nancy? Is that your better deal? Is it attacking police every day for being racist, Nancy? Is that your better deal? They have no better deal. They ought to call their platform no deal at all. They ought to go out of business. The Democrats, under the leadership of Pelosi and Schumer, should just fold up the tent, get on a train, and get out of town. This is the savage nation. If any of these topics appeal to you, it means that you're an angry man or woman. And the phone number is 855-407-282. 855-407-282. When I come back on the Savage Nation, I will play the Boy Scout speech that the liars in the media, which I do not call fake news, it's way beyond fake news. They had me believing he said something inappropriate. They had me believing that he said something off color. They had me believing that the Boy Scouts should have been offended until I actually heard Donald Trump's speech. I found it very inspiring. If I had a young boy, I wish he had been in that audience. I'll play it for you when I come back. Be here. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. Yes, Greatest show on earth, the Savage Nation. I'm playing. Uh, what was that show on TV that had this masterpiece theater with that British guy? Very, very charming. Very upper lip, or very, very upper lip. Very good for all the Anglophiles in America who uh, had hoped they could be British, uh, and the closest they came to it was uh, buying a suit from Barney's. They knew how to furl the umbrella. Poor guys on Seventh Avenue. They knew how to put the handkerchief in the lapel. But unfortunately, they were not British. Of course, at the end of the day, who wants to be British anymore with what they've allowed to happen to their country? They've capitulated. They've surrendered. There is no England anymore, as we all know. It's very sad. It was a great nation. It was very nice while it lasted that thousand years. It was a very nice nation until it was invaded as a result of the liberals who invited the, uh, you know who in. Do I have to say the word? Have you been over there recently? Can you find anyone from England in England anymore who's uh, not afraid to show that they're from England? By the way, when you're in England, have you seen a Union Jack flying anywhere? Oh, no, that was taken down by, I think it was Tony Blair, the great Englishman, Tony Blair, who did the work uh, that uh, the enemies of England never could do. He removed the Union Jack from British Airways, if I'm not mistaken, because it was offensive. It was offensive to the third worlders who like to come there and trash the nation and collect the welfare. But I'm getting too far afield from critics denouncing Trump's tacky and disrespectful Boy Scout speech. I started to believe it till I listened to the speech. Then they get fake uh, writers. Mother of an Eagle Scout. How do we know if this woman's really the mother of an Eagle Scout? Who sends a tweet that says, I'm not giving them any more money. Another one who says that he worked for 13 years. in the. We don't know. They're probably haters. The Boy Scouts love Trump. And here's the story that set this off. You judge for yourself. Clip one, please. I'll tell you a story that's very interesting for me. When I was young, there was a man named William Levitt, Levittowns. You have some here. You have some in different states. Anybody ever hear of Levittown? And he yes. was a very successful man, became unbelievable. He was a home builder, became an unbelievable success and got more and more successful. And he'd build homes. And at night, he'd go to these major sites with teams of people, and he'd scour the sites for nails and sawdust and small pieces of wood. And they'd clean the sites so when the workers came in the next morning, the sites would be spotless and clean. And he did it properly. 
And he did this for 20 years. And then he was offered a lot of money for his company. And he sold his company for a tremendous amount of money. At the time, especially. This is a long time ago. Sold his company for a tremendous amount of money. And he went out and bought a big yacht. And he had a very interesting life. I won't go any more than that because you're Boy Scouts, so I'm not going to tell you what he did. All right, so he had a very interesting life. There's an innuendo that he had some wild party. So that offended the Boy Scouts. They're boys! They're boys! They're not metrosexuals! They like that little line. He's the kind of man I grew up with. They had an interesting life. So your boy figures out what he meant by that. He bought a yacht and had an interesting life. That's a shocking thing to tell a boy? That he should behave like a boy? You sickos, you, you, you left wing, you left wing sick maniacs, you. You all belong in a mental house. A mental, a mental asylum, you idiots. That's offensive to you? That to say that the guy had an interesting life. But listen to this. Listen what Jake Tapper and Wolf Blitzer got mad at next. Listen to O2. This was offensive? Let's hear it. I saw him at a cocktail party. And it was very sad because the hottest people in New York were at this party. It was the party of, and I was doing well, so I got invited to the party. I was very young. And I go in, but I'm in the real estate business. And I see a hundred people, some of whom I recognize, and they're big in the entertainment business. And I see, sitting in the corner, was a little old man who was all by himself. Nobody was talking to him. I immediately recognized that that man was the once great William Levitt of Levittown. And I immediately went over. I wanted to talk to him more than the Hollywood show business communications people. So I went over and talked to him. And I said, Mr. Levitt, I'm Donald Trump. He said, I know. He said, Mr. Levitt, how are you doing? He goes, not well, not well at all. And he explained what was happening and how bad it's been and how hard it's been. And what he said was what? I guess that part of the speech got left out because that's the punchline. But I'll bring it back to you when I return on the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. Theater of the Mind, the Savage Nation, on the doldrums, in the doldrums of the summer. Those listening to the show are those who are not on vacation. Those left behind, the deplorables who actually have to work. They don't even get two weeks off in the summer, let alone two days, trying to make ends meet. And they, they listen to the show. They like what they hear. They don't maybe don't follow every word or every innuendo. It's okay. Last night I went to a terrible Chinese restaurant. I'm not going to talk about the food. I'm just going to talk about it. On the way out of the bathroom, guys coming in. Looked like a working man. Young guy in his 20s, maybe early 30s. Looked like a plasterer. Had some of the white on his. And he said, Michael Savage. He said, I listen to you all the time. I said, thank you. What I'm saying is, people listen to this show all the time. Do they follow every sentence? I don't know. But they listen. What are they listening for? Well, I'm giving an example of what they're listening for. If you pick up the newspapers today, Trump insulted the Boy Scouts. Trumple, Trumple, told, Trumple, I used to call him Trumple Stilskin. There's a new one for you. Take and run with it, Wolf. Trumple made a mistake, they say. Trumple talked about innuendos that were inappropriate for the Boy Scouts. He attacked the media, and they're very unhappy. And I said, well, let me listen to the speech. So he tells a story about Levitt, who built Levitt Town, made a lot of money, sold the yacht, went to the cocktail party with all the famous people, and then he saw a little man in the corner, and he went up to him. And let's hear the rest of the story in clip two. Mr. Levitt, I'm Donald Trump. He said, I know. He said, <clears throat> Mr. Levitt, how are you doing? He goes, not well, not well at all. And he explained what was happening and how <clears throat> bad it's been and how hard it's been. And I said... What exactly happened? Why did this happen to you? You're one of the greats ever in our industry. Why did this happen to you? And he said, Donald, I lost my momentum. And isn't there any more to the speech? They keep cutting off the best part. I have to come back in the next break to get the next punchline. 
there was more to the speech. He's trying to tell the Boy Scouts never to lose their momentum, which was just left out of the speech, which would have been the appropriate part. So the listeners listening to the show don't have to, you know, wait for the next uh, 18 minutes to hear it. But nevertheless, that was very appropriate. He was telling Boy Scouts not to lose their momentum. I don't see that that's tacky and disrespectful to say that he got a tremendous amount of money and had a very interesting life with an innuendo that he had parties and uh, was a wild guy. What was wrong with that? They're boys. Boys like to hear that kind of story. Then the UK Independent, a communist newspaper, writes, Donald Trump gives 40,000 Boy Scouts career advice from a racist, bankrupt property developer. They attack both Trump and Mr. Levitt. That's from someone who probably can't even pay her own rent, the writer for the UK Independent. Someone who wishes to God she could buy a flat in London is now attacking Levitt for how he ran his, uh, how he ran his business. Trump asked him why his business had failed, and he said, Donald, I lost my momentum. I lost my momentum, a word you never hear when you're talking about success, the president said. And the rest of the speech, he says, he lost his momentum, meaning he took this period of time off, long years, and then when he got back, he didn't have the same momentum. In life, I always tell this to people. You have to know whether or not you continue to have the momentum. And if you don't have it, that's okay. So that's a bad speech for the Boy Scouts, not to lose their momentum. I got to tell you the truth. It's true in every field. Whatever it is, whatever your field is, when you come back from vacation, even a week off, two weeks off, you know you've lost your momentum. Now imagine taking two years off from your from your profession and see what happens. You lose your, your momentum. It's that simple. It's very good. Okay, the phone number here is 855-400-7282, 855-400-SAVAGE. There's McCain. He came back. No McCain jokes, even though I have a few that I'd like to say. But I do, if I value my career, I don't really want to sit on a bench for the next number of years that I'm alive. Because I have a few things I like to say about McCain, even post-surgically. But I'll reserve that for a private conversation. Senate votes to debate Obamacare repeal as McCain returns to blast process. We wish him the speediest recovery. Our hearts and prayers go out to John McCain. That's what you want me to say? Yeah, my heart and prayer goes out to John McCain. Now I love him. Before the surgery, I, would, I didn't love him because he was a backstabbing uh, Benedict Arnold. Now I love him because he had surgery. Okay. He did, came back and did the right thing. All right, let's move on. What else do we have here in the kitty of fear? Well, let's have some fun. Now, I told you that the Dems are selling a new bill of goods. It's really an old bill of goods. They claim they're offering you a better deal, better job. Okay, what you got to listen to is Nancy Pelosi. She came up with a new phrase with her... Uh, ad people. It's called a better deal. It comes from FDR's New Deal speech. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the closest we've ever had to a big government authoritarian, in other words, a socialist. He was loved by the poor, and he was hated by the middle class for what he did to this country. The centralization of power, the power grabs, the authoritarianism, it was hated by most people in America who, who were working for a living and making it in America. It was loved by those on the bottom because he gave them huge handouts. So now Pelosi and the gang come up with a thing called Better Deal. Let's hear old Pelosi, who is uh, channeling FDR in Clip 7. Today, Democrats are unveiling an ambitious and aggressive new <laughs> economic agenda. Sorry. And a bold new promise to America's <laughs> working families. <laughs> From the heartland... These members are from the heartland, but to the suburbs, to the cities, Democrats Whoa. are offering a better deal. Wow. Better jobs, better wow. wages, a wow. better future. Wow. A better deal is founded on strong values <laughs> that we share. Strong values fueled by fresh ideas. Oh, okay. Strong values. So she's like uh, a supporter of the leather parade in San Francisco where people appear naked and whip each other in public, in stocks, in chains. That's our idea of better values. Have you ever seen what goes on in Nancy Pelosi's backyard? Those are the better values she wants your boy to uh, grow up with. Nancy, it's not going to sell in the heartland. They actually despise you. They despise you, Nancy, to your, to your last shred of DNA because they know what you stand for. Yes, it will be an ambitious and aggressive new agenda, but it won't be for the American people. It will be for you and your and your cronies in the Democrat leadership. You and your cronies who sacked the country for eight years under Obama. You and your cronies in the fake uh, green business. You and your cronies who made billions upon billions of dollars with fake solar plants 
uh, in the Nevada desert, the Arizona desert, the California desert, producing very low wattage for uh, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. We know that, Nancy, and I'm not alone. Number two, here's another good one. Dem Democrat, rep <laughs> Democrat Representative Nadler, remember him? He used to be a fat guy, then he went on some di diet like Jenny Craig or something. I liked Nadler better when he was a fat guy for New York. He was a roly-poly, Damon Runyon kind of Democrat. He looked like the guy in The Sopranos uh, to me. Uh, the one, Anyway, I liked Nadler when he looked like that. So then he attacks Trump, and he compares him to the Nazis who talked about the Lugenpress. Uh, when, uh, of course, the Nazis, when they use the phrase Lugenpress, they're talking about the lying press. So now he's linking Trump to the Nazis in clip 08. This is from NTK Network. you got to hear this, 08. We've had a very partisan press, going back to Jefferson versus Adams. You had, you know, press with no standards at all, very partisan, uh, not terribly oh. truthful, and so forth. Oh. But we got used to, over the last, I don't know, 50 or so years, oh. a more responsible uh, press, and we got... <laughs> Wait a minute. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop right there. Stop this. We had... He starts by saying the truth. We had a partisan press with no standards. Not truthful. But then he said we got used to, over the last 50 years, a more responsible press? You mean when there was Walter Krankenhaus? When there were three people in the media who told us the lies? All the same lies over and over again on ABC, CBS, and NBC? That was the only news. I grew up on this garbage. And if you got sick of the ads, you went to the other station in the very same second that you left ABC and went to CBS, they were on an ad. The very same second you went to ABC, CBS, NBC, they were breaking at the same minute. I noticed that. And they were all running the same stories at the same time. That's his idea of a more independent press, a more responsible press. Well, now he makes a launch from that into attacking Trump. I don't know. Robert, can you pick it up from there or not? Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, press, and we got more dependent, not more dependent on it, but we got used to it and could rely on it. The precedent now, where the president of the United States keeps talking about the lying press, about the, the, you know, fake news and everything's fake news, you look back at uh, uh, the Nazis who talked about the Lugan press, the, the lying press. You destroy the faith in, in any information other than from... Um, President Trump or his apologists or whoever. What is his point? Why does he make a jump to the Lugan press statements of the Nazis, to the fact that we know that the liars in the media are liars in the media? What is Nadler saying? First of all, he gave himself away by saying, we all know that the press has no standards at all. We all know the press is very partisan. We all know the press is not very truthful. And he said, we got used to it. And over the last 50 years, he said, we had a more responsible press. And then he made a slip of the tongue, and he said, we got more dependent. And he said, oh, no, not more dependent on it, but we got used to it. Meaning, yeah, we all got more dependent on the Lugan press in America. The Lugan press of the big three in the media, the lying press. Just because Hitler used it against the German press doesn't mean that using it in America against the American media is wrong. Jerry, you know that. You mean when it worked for you and your party, it was a good press. Now it's working against you and your party, it's a Lugan press. Is that it? Okay, so that's another one. There's more and more and more. There's no end to it. Uh, so these are some of the stories. I like to switch to the sperm count in Western men. Plunges to re record. I don't know why I'm jumping to that from Gerald Nadler. Or maybe it's just a, maybe it's a, a psychological jump. I don't know why, but I'm going from Gerald Nadler's diet and new look. Like the guy in The Sopranos. Remember when he went on that diet? The the fat, roly-poly guy in The Sopranos. Raise your hand if you know who I'm talking about. No, you don't know. Okay, whatever. And then he comes out of the thing, and he's on a diet now, and he's wearing new clothing. Sperm count in Western men plunges to record low as scientists blame chemicals and everyday products for crisis. All right. It's fallen by more than 50% in 40 years and is showing no signs of slowing down. Study did not examine causes. But scientists believe the amount of chemicals used in everyday products industry and farming may be behind the crisis. Researchers from the Hebrew University Hadassah Brown School of Public Health and Community Medicine and the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai screened 7,500 studies that took place between 1973 and 2011, and they found that it's a big deal here. Decreasing sperm count has been of great concern since it was first reported 25 years ago. This shows the decline is strong and continuing. They think that it's related to chemicals and commerce, and that's the relationship.
The study was published in the Human Reproduction Update, and it said no significant decline in sperm count was seen in Africa, none was seen in Asia, and none was seen in South America. Wow. Talk about hybrid vigor. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. All right, welcome back to the Savage Nation. We'll talk about Donald Trump's speech of the Boy Scout Jamboree. Was it appropriate? The sperm count story. Interesting, isn't it? But before we do, my friends, you know I talk a lot about the amazing benefits that you get with certain things like Super Beets, right? Why? Because Super Beets is one of the most impressive natural functional foods I've ever seen. That is why I mention it on the show. It's related to blood flow, blood flow, blood flow. Beets are loaded with dietary nitrates. They convert into nitric oxide in the body. And Super Beets is the easiest way to get these natural dietary nitrates to specifically help with blood flow and circulation. Super Beets does work three times faster to give you results you can feel, and it tastes great. You'll feel the energy and stamina it gives you within 20 minutes, and I want you to feel it. I want you to feel it. And if you haven't tried it yet, now is the time to try it. For a limited time, you'll get 10 10 of them, on-the-go packets of Super Beats to pop in your desk drawer, purse, or gym bag. You'll get more energy, more stamina, and support healthy circulation. What are you waiting for? This is on top of the free canister, the free indicator strips, and free book you get with your first order when you call 800-4810504. That's 800-4810504. Or go to savagelovesbeats.com. That's savagelovesbeats.com. It's guaranteed to get your money back. Call 800-4810504. That's 800-481-0504, or go to savagelovesbeats.com. Should I say it again? Savagelovesbeats.com. Let's go to Chad on KSFO, line two. Go ahead, please. Hey, Michael, I just wanted to tell you, I think I'm probably one of your youngest listeners. Uh, I love listening to you. My wife loves when you talk about uh, Teddy and stuff, but, uh, you know, I've, I've turned off every other talking head on the Internet and YouTube, but you're the only guy that stands up and still speaks the truth and gives Trump exactly what he needs to hear. I appreciate that. Well, I'm not attacking him for his speech at the Boy Scout Jamboree. Did you notice that? I did. So, in other words, I call him as I see him. He gave a great speech at the Boy Scout Jamboree. Do I support him in his attacks on Sessions? Absolutely not. In fact, two weeks ago or a week ago, I tweeted, why is he, st why is he throwing Sessions overboard? And the, the, the clones, the bots, attacked me like crazy on that. I don't know what he's doing with Sessions. Doesn't it disturb you? Yeah, yeah, I have no idea. It boggles my mind. It boggles everyone's mind. Of all the people to attack so publicly, it should not be Jeff Sessions. He seems to be saving his vitriol for Sessions, more vitriol for Sessions than his worst enemies. He says worse things about Jeff Sessions than Kim Jong-un. Thank you for that appreciative <laughs> comment. I'll send you a tr copy of Trump's War for that. You can go out and buy yourself a lot of goat yogurts if you trade it in at your nearest bookstore. You can probably get 2 $3 for it now on a trade-in. Just a joke. All right, my friends, how do you get your momentum back? Trump said to the Boy Scouts that the old man was shriveled up because he had retired with a lot of money, went on the yacht, came back, lost his momentum. How do you get your momentum back? I don't know. I never lost it. Maybe you did. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Me, a cat, moving in with a new human. It took a little getting used to. She has these weird games she likes to play, like this giant feather. She sticks it in my face. I swat it away. She sticks it in my face. I swat it away. It's almost like she thinks I enjoy it. But seeing how much fun she gets out of it, well, I guess it makes it all worth it. Humans. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel.
Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. The record and documents I have voluntarily provided will show that all of my actions were proper and occurred in the normal course of events of a very unique campaign. Oh, Lord. Let me be very clear. I did not collude with Russia, nor do I know of anyone else in the campaign who did so. Oh, boy. I had no improper contacts. I have not relied on Russian funds for my business. Okay, I got it. Very I've good. Fully... You didn't have to give this speech. It's sad that the country has now devolved to a big lie within a big lie within a bigger lie in a box of big lies created by Hillary Clinton's campaign of liars. Welcome to the Savage Nation. But having said that, Kushner made a big error today, in my opinion, by speaking at all. I really didn't want to hear him speak. And also, you know, when I hear someone say I did not do something publicly, I immediately assume they did. For some weird reason, when he said I did not have collusion with that woman, I, I'm sorry, uh, I know he didn't because there was nothing there, I guess, but why did he have to say that? There was no need for this. Moreover, he's not a very appealing speaker. We were talking today about uh, <laughs> inspiration, speeches, inspirational speeches, and I compared the speeches of Churchill in the movie Dunkirk, which I saw last night, with the sad lack of leadership and inspiration that we have today. Uh, sadly, Kushner is not an inspiring speaker. Probably a good person, uh, a fine businessman, and a great husband and father, and a wonderful son-in-law, but that's really not my business. I have no idea why he decided who advised him to get up there in public. And I'll ask you, the, li the listener, to be the jury, the judge and the jury here, on a very simple note. Did Trump's son-in-law, Kushner, today... Did the speech he gave help or hurt him? Did it help him or hurt him? I also want to talk about Dunkirk the movie in more detail and the movie Free State of Jones, which depicts the horrors of slavery in the uh, pre-Civil War, actually the Civil War and post-Civil War South, in a very accurate manner because the um, consultants were pretty across the board in their politics and very well done. This is the Savage Nation these are the topics. The phone number is 855-400-7282. Let's begin uh, with uh, Pat on WTMA in South Carolina, Line 1. Pat, welcome to the program. What's your topic today? Much. Oh, my God Almighty, I listen to you every day. And I'm from Lawrence, Long Island, and I know you know we're for Rockway, because I know you've mentioned it a couple of times. But God bless you. Keep doing what you're doing. We need it. We are in desperate, desperate Trouble. Well, what do you mean with desperate? What will you call to talk about a pilot in the RAF? I see on the board. What is it you're calling him? <laughs> it is, and, and yes, that was my brother, who died in in in, uh, in January fifteenth, in nineteen forty five. He was after the uh, he was uh, bombing those uh, ships. Uh, the no, uh, I take that back. He wasn't bombing the ships so much as he was fighting off the, the flyers from the Germans. I understand you're a little nervous right now. You're on national radio. I understand it's easy to make mistakes. We're not here to ridicule you. So your brother was a pilot in the RAF. He was a, one of the brave men in the in the Spitfires, as depicted in the movie Dunkirk. He was in that wonderful airplane fighting the uh, ME-109s, and he got shot down over the sea? Yes, and, and he, uh, yes, he, he died in the North Sea, and uh, he flew out of Banff for, with all his, it's the 143rd Squadron in England, and it was a very, very well-known uh, squadron. And what, Pat, was your brother from the upper classes, or was he from the middle class? What, what was the background of your family? I would say upper class. See, what did I say earlier? Isn't it true that most of the RAF pilots were from the, let us say, upper reaches of society? Well, you know, I, you know, at that time, he, he didn't have a job, and he was, you know, in his 20 and idolistic, and he went to Canada. So many people went to Canada who, who joined the RAF. So mm -hmm. many Americans. So and was he, 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 was a, he was flying as a Canadian or as a Brit? He got, no, 
he, 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 as an American, he went to Canada for training. And when his training and he got his training... You know, you're confusing me, Pat. Are you British or are you American? I'm a Yankee from Far Rockaway almost. So how does your brother wind up flying in the RAF for, in Canada? You got us all mixed up, but thanks for the call. It's a, it's a story that's, as we say in Brooklyn, sedreit. That's called a sedreit minish mein cup. You know what that means? Don't twist my head around like a dreidel. Even though we're not near that holiday. And they're spinning in circles. You can't follow the guy. I'm not going to blame the call screener, but usually you ask him to isolate the call. What is he talking about? And you focus him. This one, I got this, and I let, and I hem, and I ho, and I went, I'm from Britain, and Canada, and the U.S., and he flew, and he went up, and he went down, and he was high class, low. I didn't know what he was talking about. Thank you. Your heart's in the right place, and you have my sympathies for the uh, heroism of your brother. And now let's move on already. 855-407-282, phone number. Please don't call me about Obamacare. Whatever you do. You will not hear me talk about health care. I talk about health issues, not health care. That's my specialty. We'll talk about health another day. Maybe once a week I should do a, a segment on it with a couple of experts from the field of orthomolecular medicine. That would be better than talking about Obamacare. Self-care is awfully interesting to me. 855-407-282. I don't want to hear any more about Obamacare. I don't want to hear any more about Jared. I love the Evening Standards headline. I did not have corrupt relations with that country. Very funny. You know, it's enough already. I didn't like him turning his back on the press. I found it offensive. If you watch the press conference, I, I found it offensive. I found it offensive for this unknown son-in-law to come out like he's the president, in essence. I mean, he gave a speech. I haven't seen Trump give a speech like that to the press recently. There was Jared Kushner already. Gave the Metro speech. He did nothing wrong, which I'm sure he didn't do. And then, not a question, turns his back and walks away like he's J uh, JFK. He is not JFK. I didn't elect him. I'm tired of this already. WABC, Stewart, line five. Go ahead. You're on the Savage Nation. What's your topic? Yes, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, Dunkirk. And uh, I haven't seen the movie. I will see it. Uh, uh, I'm something of a student of World War II. My dad was in it. Uh, but it reminded me... Uh, how it contrasts with uh, a British movie called The White Cliffs of Dover, uh, which was about the same topic, but it, it was very, very different. And in that movie, a British woman, I believe played by Greer Garson, was attacked by a German flyer uh, down uh, near her home. And the difference seemed to be, uh, okay, it was made during the war, that was a big difference, but... Uh, People knew uh, what evil was. Today, people... Well, well, you heard, did you hear my opening monologue where I said that he left out any insignia of the enemy, even the word Nazi was not in it? Yes, yes. Uh, All right, so that's what triggered your call. I understand it, but let me say this. In order to talk about the movie Dunkirk, I think you owe it to yourself to see it, even though it is lacking in historical context, and, and badly so, it's worth going to from one point of view. It shows the story through several storylines that are very emotionally engaging, and your heart is moved by the plight of the men on the beach, the plight of the boys trapped in a sinking ship, uh, the plight of the of the uh, individual from Britain in his own little pleasure boat who was sent out by the British, mil British uh, government amongst a thousand little boats to rescue the boys on the beach, and his little story, that engages you in a way that uh, historical dramas generally do not. It was very, very interesting. And I've never seen aerial combat as breathtakingly portrayed as I did in, the, in this uh, film. Uh, interestingly, the, one of the RAF pilots, the lead pilot, was played by one of my favorite actors, whose name I forget. I'm a little caught up in the movie now. Because you never see his face. He's behind the mask the whole time. It's only at the end that you see his face. But I mean, you feel what it must have been like, as best as a person who's not a pilot, and a combat pilot at that, to face the enemy in the middle of a, a vast sky where you don't even know in those days where the guy was. There was no radar. In other words, they're in a gunfight with the other guy if they even find him, and then he pulls off, and then he's looking with his own head up, down, around. He doesn't know where the guy went. Can you imagine that the kind of guts it took to fly in one of those things and then to hear bullets ripping into your plane when you realize he got behind you? Can you imagine that? Well, the film helps you kind of imagine what kind of guts it took, and then it leads you right to today. What kind of guts does it take to fly 
uh, uh, an F-18 hornet off the deck of an aircraft carrier in combat. I don't know if they go into combat anymore. This hasn't been an aerial dogfight in 30 years. I don't remember the last one. I pray we don't see one with the Russians, as Senator Schumer would allegedly like. Maybe Schumer would like to see a dogfight between America and Russia. Maybe then he could cheer over a corned beef down there in New York somewhere. I wouldn't be cheering if we got into a dogfight with Russia. That's the worst thing on earth that could happen to us, is to go to war with Russia. But let's stick to the issues we're talking about today. And the issues are many. And the phone number is simple. And the phone number is 855-407-282. The topics I think you know. KSFO, Eric Line 1, what's the topic, please? Good afternoon, Dr. Savage. I wanted to talk to you about Dunkirk. Uh, I agree with you, an excellent uh, action movie. I do have a degree in 20th century history, so hmm. uh, the first thing that hit me right away is that there was no representation of the Nazis, nothing to do with Winston Churchill. However, I would argue that that movie needs to be used as a springboard for not only our generation, but the newest generation, to explore more about not only that battle, but World War II as well, too. I agree a thousand percent. It's a very exciting action movie, and it'll get a lot of young people excited about that action movie, but they may ask, who was flying those planes that were bombing the boys on the beach? And who were the boys on the beach? They looked like a bunch of cowards running away from battle, by the way. They looked like losers. Well, they, uh, it's an interesting segue because Oshkosh up in Wisconsin starts today. Go take a stroll along the World War II air aircraft lines and talk to those guys. And uh, Doc, a restored B-29, is also there at Oshkosh. Go talk to the guys that flew that. They're in their 90s now, but they'd be more than happy to talk to a young kid about what it took to fly those planes into combat in World War II. And if I may... I, I can only imagine, but I, I ask myself how many men are left like that in the country today. I know they're in the military. I know they're on the front lines in Afghanistan. They're on the front lines uh, in hidden ways in other places in the world. They're on the ships. They're on uh, in the Air Force. But where are they? Why do we never see them? Why does the media only show the wounded warrior? Why does the media only show another side of the military, never the patriotic, heroic side? The answer is quite simple. Very, very simple why the media does that. They're not fake news at all. That's where I disagree with Trump. He's got it half right. They're not fake news at all. There's another word for propaganda, and it's not fake news. Would you agree with that as a historian, Eric? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, the, the parallels between what we have for media now and what was going on, particularly in Nazi Germany, but I would also argue you hear in the States up to and including World War II are breathtakingly similar. And if I may finish, Doctor, I think a good place for people to start to get the actual sense of what the British went through is to look at the excellent BB series World at War, narrated by the always uh, smooth-voiced Lawrence Olivier, Sir Lawrence Olivier. Oh, yes, I've watched that many times over many years. Absolutely. Frank, Cap yeah. Frank Capra is why we... Are you a historian yourself? I am not employed as a historian, but I loved every minute that I've been in college, and I certainly... I see. Well, I thank you very much for at least relating to the movie. Again, I'll, I'll make it a simple show for you today, which is Trump's son-in-law Kushner's speech, which you have seen now on the news over and over again. Did his speech help or hurt him? Did it help or hurt his case? By the way, he shouldn't even have a case to defend. That's the bigger picture. And all he did was remind us that there may be a case against him by speaking. Big error. Big error. Big error. He shouldn't have spoken. I sent an email to people in the inner circle. I said, tell him not to give a speech after the Senate hearing. He's got nothing to gain. Why did he do it? And there's only one answer. And the answer is unbridled egotism. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. The battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Where did this come from? Upon it depends... All right, well, that's Winston Churchill's great, great speech. Very inspiring, something I crave for every day in the United States of America. I look back, and although I, 
I despised Obama's policies. I despised his divisiveness. I, at the time, said, and it took me a while to say this, it took me a couple of years, he was the greatest left-wing propagandist I have ever seen in my life. He was a genius at public relations. I'm talking about Obama. He could sell communism to a nation that never embraced it. He could sell racism to a nation that rejected it. He could sell division to a nation that didn't want it. And he did so on a daily basis and was never, ever attacked for it by the Wolf Blitzers and the Jake Tappers, ever. And so now we come to a new president, and we ask the president to get in front of the cameras again. We ask the president to become Churchillian and not Twitter anymore. I doubt very much that he will listen to me. I think he's listening to someone else in the media who is misadvising him badly. Yes, his popularity is at 50% amongst those who voted for him. I know that. But if you're not going to accept the fact that the nation is divided and as president try to unite it, then you're not going to be a good leader. It's that simple. The president has an obligation to bring us together, not only to speak to those who voted for him. And this is a problem that Obama was guilty of as well. Obama spoke only to his left-wing base. He never, ever addressed those of us who, uh, well, I say deplored his viewpoints. That's why they called us the deplorables during the Hillary Clinton years uh, campaign. We deplored Obama's divisiveness, and then we became the deplorables to them. But he never, ever addressed our concerns, our fears, our wants, our, our dreams. He only directed his speeches to his base. Well... Hillary tried the same thing, and she lost. She lost by a hair. We can argue over whether she won or lost. We can argue over the illegal aliens voting. We can argue over a lot of things. But she lost because she didn't have a good net message. And that is because she spoke only to her base. Trump is making the same error. He's speaking only to his base. He is using the same vitriol he used during the campaign. And it's not working except for his base. He needs to step out of the campaign mode and into the leadership mode. And that's all I'm going to say on that issue. I'll be right back to talk about, well, slavery on the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. All right, I don't want to drone on and on about the movie Dunkirk, but I know it's going to be a very big hit over the next few days and weeks, and you're going to see it. And you got to remember, it's historical, it's, it's revisionism. They don't show the word Nazi, they don't show the word German, they call them the enemy. You only see the swastika on the ME-109 briefly. Uh, you barely see the Union Jack anywhere, so you don't even know who's fighting. And the director is a universalist, New World Order type, brilliant storyteller, and it's worth going to if you know the story of Dunkirk. However, I, I'll give you some warning, do not bring children to this movie. You may think, oh, it's inspiring and my kid will want to join the military, he'll be patriotic. He may not. Your son or daughter might get very scared watching this movie because the sound effects are overwhelming to an adult who has seen thousands of hours of war movies, thousands of hours of documentaries on World War II. If you sit in a the theater with a great sound system, the sound will scare this child because it's the sound of the plane buzzing overhead. It's the sound of a sinking ship. It's the sound of men drowning. If, believe it or not, there is a sound of men drowning. Uh, there's the sound of bullets going through the hull of an iron ship, threatening the men inside. Uh, the music score is Academy Award level. Everything about it is overwhelming to the mind and, and to the soul. I wouldn't bring a child to that. I really wanted to talk about freedom and slavery today by launching uh, into the story behind the movie The Free State of Jones. It's a new film that came out last year with Matthew McConaughey who plays Confederate soldier Newton Knight. Now, you may see him as a hero or a traitor, depending upon how you see the Civil War. However, it's a great movie, and I caught it by accident on Saturday watching TV. I had a lot of time on my hands, and I was reading, watching TV, and I read a book I also wanted to talk about that I may get to this week, uh, entitled uh, The Day of the Locust. It's a very poignant story written in the 1930s about the let's say the lower echelon of Hollywood and the mass mentality of Hollywood. Boy, was that a book. I wish I had it in front of me now. I'd write, read you some of the quotes from that one, The Day of the Locust by Nathaniel West. 
in many ways, Nathaniel West as a writer is similar to what I am as a talk show host, and I'll explain that at another time. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'd rather get back to the slavery and freedom issue. The film, the story, The Free State of Jones. He was a southerner, was fighting in the Confederate Army, and he was a poor farmer who, in 1863, abandoned the southern cause and spent the rest of his life fighting against oppression, fighting against oppression. He relied upon, in his mind, the Bible and the Declaration of Independence. He believed there were no kings on earth above him or any other human being. He said there's only one king, and that's God. And so his own faith, that white farmer, trumped the dominant values of society at the time, and he risked his life. He deserted the Confederacy when he realized the fight wasn't his. And frankly, he joined other whites and blacks in a rebellion. And they took uh, control of a large portion of Mississippi, Jones County, Mississippi, and they declared it a free state, a free state that was aligned neither with the South nor the North. I do not want to talk about the white male Southern stereotype. Uh, I want to talk about freedom versus slavery. He was a great man as portrayed in this movie. As I say, Free State of Jones, I recommend it. Take your children to see that on television at least. He rescued children who were in slavery. Now, that's an important story. After the Civil War, after the emancipation of the black slave, we wake up to find out that the southern slaveholders now had the slaves working on the plantation again, but they were no longer called slaves. They were called apprentices. What an apprenticeship that was. They were slaves all over again. And this was after the Civil War was over. This is astounding. I didn't know that. I had no idea. Well, the story shows him going to rescue the son of his good friend Moses, uh, who he had fought with, to rescue his own little boy who had been put back in the fields. The kid was around 11, 12 years old. And what they had to do to buy this son's freedom from uh, the, uh, you know, the, the courtroom, so to speak, to buy and with 20 pieces of silver, in essence, to buy this, this, uh, this uh, uh, black kid's freedom back all over again. It's a pretty interesting story if you didn't know that little part of, of history, which is awesome. But it was Hollywood, nevertheless. You see what the Ku Klux Klan was really like if you lived in the South at that time. You see what it's like to see them come in on their horses in their white robes and burn a farm to the ground or to hang uh, a black man. And you get to feel the terror of living in those times and what it was like. And that is, again, the movie Free State of Jones. But I, I want to make it a broader picture about freedom versus slavery. The greatest slavery there is, is of course to be in chains. Let's not forget the physical slavery. But another form of slavery is to be enslaved with the idea that you have to walk around with a chip on your shoulder because your ancestors were enslaved. That is an enslavement unto itself and it's a trick used by the overbosses of today who are in essence slave masters. I realize these words can be misconstrued so I'll have to explain them again. When you have white leaders in the Democrat Party stirring up, let us say, the oppressed minority, whoever they may be, and telling them that they're much like the slaves, you do a disservice both to those who were actually enslaved and to those who are believing in you because you're enslaving them again with the big lie. There's no, no greater crime you can commit to a young person than to tell them to walk around with a hatred for society because that will enslave them in a losing cause. They're not going to be anything in their lives. Maybe they can go to work for a university somewhere and continue their uh, attitude, but that kind of nonsense has long enslaved people. Ask black people who went through the 60s and were revolutionaries at the time and then woke up to what it did to them. Ask them if it was something that was beneficial to them or kept them, kept them down. And I think that um, if they give you an honest answer, you'll find out it kept them down. And that's why I recommend this movie, uh, The Free State of Jones, as terrifying as it is to see the horrors of slavery in the South as depicted in this movie. I mean, reality is different, of course. Uh, there was an element to it that was liberating and inspiring, and that's all I want to say on that. And here's another one, which is an interesting story from Todd Starnes of Fox News. Sarah Huckabee Sanders called Butch Queen by Daily Beast writer and the left is silent. This is a great article. As you know, Sarah Huckabee Sanders is uh, the White House press secretary. 
And he writes that just moments after President Trump promoted Sarah Huckabee Sanders to the role of White House press secretary, she was attacked by a swarm of woman-hating liberals. And they said nothing about that. First, the propagandists of the New York Times and MSNBC questioned Sanders' character, called her a liar. Ira Madison III, whoever that cretin is, of the Daily Beast, whoever they are, and they're really bad people. The Daily Beast is filled with some of the most vicious lowlives in American uh, history. They tweeted this about this woman, quote, Butch Queen first time in drags at ball, he tweeted to his followers, as lo along with a photograph of the press secretary. This guy Madison is the same, quote, journalist who cracked a racially charged joke about Attorney General Jeff Sessions' Asian American granddaughter during his confirmation hearings. This Cretan's tweet implied Sessions had borrowed her from a Toys R Us store so that he could use her as a political prop. This creep at the Daily Beast later apologized and deleted the tweet. He also wrote a disgusting attack on HUD, her Housing and Urban Development Secretary Ben Carson, wondering if his rule in the Trump White House was going to be house or field. You know, that's a reference to slavery. It's sickening. But Hollywood was particularly vicious to Sanders. Comedian uh, Clea Hughes, whoever that thing is, uh, said, I felt like Sarah Huckabee Sanders left and right eye switched places or something. So-called comedian. A Clea Hughes wrote on Twitter. Family Guy writer Damien Fahey wrote, Sarah Huckabee Sanders looks like every woman eating lobster on a cruise ship. I, I don't think these are funny lines. Can you imagine what would have happened had a journalist or comedian made similar remarks about former First Lady Michelle Obama? about her shape or her size or abuse of the taxpayers' money. But there's been no outrage on the attacks on Sarah Huckabee Sanders. No outcry from the feminist movement. None whatsoever. As you well know, there is a triple standard. Okay, my friends, that's that story, and we can move on to other stories. The phone number here is 855-400-7282. We can talk about, well, the topics I've been talking about. WABC Jerry Line 1, go ahead. Please, you're on the Savage Nation. Yeah, hi, Michael. Um, my wife and I recently were in South Carolina, Charleston, and we went to a to the the slave mart, which was in the center of the city. And we went through it. We saw the horrific pictures of how uh, slaves were brought to America in boats, and how the sharks would follow the boats. And uh, depending on how long the trip was, many of them did survive. When I finished, I went out and spoke to the elderly black docent who was there. And knowing how politically uh, charged this is, I asked her about reparations. And she said, not monetary. I said, well, what, what would you want? She said, freedom. I said, freedom? Do you have freedom? She says, no, complete freedom. The freedom like you have. And she, doc she told me about a documentary called The 13th Amendment, which basically looks at the prison population of America and how it's been increasing because the 13th Amendment says you can't own a slave, but if you're picked up by the police and you're put into the prison, you can be put to work, and that's why the prison population... All right, all right, let, let's stop right there. So you're implying, as this docent was, that all men in prison are, are innocent. Of course not. Of course not. What she was saying is that there is... Well, well, what is she saying? They're in prison and they're slaves because they're in prison? No, she was saying that there is a, still a racism and that the prison population has still been increasing, and, and, and that many... Yeah, but that applies across the board. Anyone who is in prison is subjected to the same rules, whether they're black, white, Asian, or, or Hispanic. What's the difference? The difference is, was the... If you have a taillight out down south and you get pulled over, uh, the police officer will say to you, uh, Michael, get your taillight fixed. If I was just through the shop and I know that I don't have a tail light out and I say, officer, uh, I don't think so. He says, oh, yeah, well, you come down to the to the courthouse. And the next right, so you're giving a generalized statement that when a cop pulls you over in the south, if you're black, you're arrested automatically even for a tail light. Is that what you're saying, Jerry? That's what she was implying. And that's what the well, because she's a, a, a political individual in a slave museum. She's been cauterized with her own viewpoint and she thinks it applies to society as a whole, and she also has not yet broken free of the doxy that she was brought up on, which is that of victim, a an oppressed victim at that. And that's a form of slavery. That's what I was trying to say. 
No, I got to say, it's not limited to people of that particular community. I see the same thing, and I've seen it in my own life in the Jewish community. The Jews who walk around with the story of the Holocaust foremost in their mind are, in, in essence, enslaved by their own memory and enslaved by their own history. Yes, of course, the Holocaust was horrendous. But if that becomes the defining moment of being Jewish, then you've lost your entire culture and your religion. That's a very important point, Jerry. And it also enslaves the Jewish person to walk around with the Holocaust mentality. What it does is it gives you a superiority complex, number one. It can justify horrible acts on your part, saying, they did it to me, I'll do it to them. And also it enslaves the people. That's the whole point that I'm trying to make with freedom and slavery, Jerry. Okay. All right. I understand it is going over most people's heads. It's in the middle of the summer. No one wants to talk about heavy-duty things. But if you do want to talk about it, uh, let me tell you something. The University of Savage is still open for business. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. We'll get back to all the topics of the day in a minute on the Savage Nation. The phone number here is 855-407-282. But I want to tell you that, look, sooner or later, your car is going to break down. It's a fact. Every car, truck, and SUV owner knows. You know this. I mean, I've had used cars. And if you're lucky, it happens while still under the manufacturer's warranty. And the repairs are covered. What if it happens after the warranty expires? You could be out of pocket thousands to get it fixed. That's why I recommend getting extended coverage like I did from CarShield.com. A new engine or tranny could cost over 5000 bucks. A simple repair today to a sensor, a few thousand bucks. Well, skip that hassle. CarShield makes the whole process easy. You see, you select your favorite mechanic, or you can even go to the dealership to do the work. There's no checks in the mail or waiting for reimbursement because CarShield gets the mechanic paid directly. CarShield's administrators even give you the VIP treatment, providing 24-7 roadside assistance and a rental car while yours is in the shop so you're not left stranded in the cold. If your car is 3 to 12 years old, it doesn't mean you have to pay high repair bills. No, no, no. CarShield administrators have paid out close to $2 billion in claims, and they're ready to help you. You know how? Save yourself thousands of potential car repairs. Get covered by the ultimate and extended vehicle service protection before it is too late. All you got to do is call 800-CAR-6100, mention code SAVAGE, or visit carshield.com and use code SAVAGE, and you're going to get 10% off. That's carshield.com, code SAVAGE. A deductible may apply. John on WFTL in Florida. Go ahead. You're on the Savage Nation. What is your topic? Dr. Savage, I wanted to talk about slavery, and slavery is the new mental disorder. I'm a black man. I learned the skill. I work for a black doctor. I don't need reparations. I just need a fair hand to keep the government out of my pocket. The problem is in my community is that the black man has been taught that it's they, the white man's keeping them down, and, and, and we're behind the eight ball already, and, it's, and they're just invisible barriers now. It's like that dog with the shock collar. You take the collar off, he still won't cross the yard because he's programmed to. No, I agree with you. I said that I wanted to talk. This is a tough topic for me as a white man, John, to talk about freedom and slavery. And I know it can easily be misconstrued, but I think you heard me loud, <coughs> loud and clear as I launched into this discussion uh, as a result of seeing the movie Free State of Jones, which I highly recommend. I have tremendous empathy, never mind sympathy, because that's hollow, empathy for what slavery does to human beings. And the fact is, is that it can cauterize people for generations, which is a form of slavery unto itself. Isn't that what we're agreeing on, John? That's exactly what we're agreeing on. And on top of that, just the segregationists that makes this even worse. I mean, I think the only solution is for us to all to come together and realize that there is no color. And as an eye care professional, I can tell you that color is really just a perception of color anyway. So, I mean, can we all just come together? And black people are even more guilty, if not, you know, if not just as guilty, as keeping this divide. I mean, I'm all for black power and for black businesses. Yeah, all that's fine. But at the same time, I just need a good, good quality product, regardless where it comes from. And Thank it's you. Just I, I think I once wrote that without quality, there can be no equality. And that was my way of trying to say what you just said. I'm going to send you a quality book called Trump's War, because I know of all people listening today, you're going to be the one who received this valuable present because it's the ideas that count, not the man. Trump's war is about ideas. Did you hear me? 
Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, the Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. Talking about the movie Dunkirk, yeah. again, it's a great action movie, don't get me wrong, but it has, it's devoid of history. Let me tell you right now, it's very inspiring for those of you who understand who was battling. If you understand that the British guys who were stranded on the beach were the good guys, and the airplanes overhead that were strafing them and blowing up the ships that were trying to evacuate them back to Britain were the good guys. I mean, the airplanes above were not the good guys. They were the bad guys because you don't see the Iron Cross on the ME-109s. As far as film goes, the best, the best war film I've ever seen in my life. But it's it's a repeat of War is Evil, which we all know it is. But sometimes you have to fight, whether it's in a schoolyard when you're being bullied or uh, someone breaks into your house, whether you want to fight or not, you have to. And I don't think that's a message that comes across very well in this film. Uh, the fact is that sometimes it's essential and necessary to define evil. And you define evil by showing Hitler a flash of a gas chamber, a flash of the invasion of a, of a city, a, a, a flash of the killing chambers, but it was not in there. You don't see that. You don't see the Iron Cross on the ME-109s. The aerial combat scenes were the best I've ever seen in movies, ever. Great action film. Chris's film, Dunkirk, great action film. But he did Batman before this, I think. But he uses the word universal in describing how he made this movie. He used the word universal. And he did it sort of as a modern day, all is quiet on the Western Front. There's no Churchill in it. How can you do a Dunkirk film without Churchill? How can you do a Dunkirk film without Hitler? How can you do a Dunkirk film without Nazis? You understand what I'm saying to you? But I still say go see the film, especially if you know the storyline. Now, we'll talk about the Dunkirk evacuation, the dumbing down of Dunkirk. Great article by Dorothy Rabinowitz in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, she takes on Christopher Nolan, the director, whose credits include Batman Begins and The Dark Knight. And she says that the director, Nolan said that he wanted to avoid making a film, quote, not relevant to today's audiences, and that he didn't want to get them bogged down in, quote, politics. Well, in that regard, he's just being cowardly and evasive, in my opinion. It doesn't mean he's not a great filmmaker. He is. Fabulous storyteller. Again, fabulous storyteller. But there's no Churchill. There's no picture of the enemy. No image of the Nazi. He doesn't mention the word Germany, Nazi, ever. He calls them the enemy. Well, it's all true. But when you see the enemy planes smashing the troops on the beach, when you see the enemy bombers bombing the ships, evacuating them, you have to ask yourself, who was the enemy? Well, every once in a while you get a little peek of the insignia identifying the Nazi nation to which those planes belong, but you don't know who they are. There's no, uh, no, 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 direction, no direction to that. So again, I recommend the movie, but go there with the caveat that you have to know who the good guys are and the bad guys are. Although it was a great action movie, it was a piece of historical revisionism that was embarrassing. The director should be ashamed of himself because there was not one picture of the word Nazi, not a Nazi flag. You could not make out the Iron Cross on the ME-109s. He did not mention the word Nazi in any of the uh, script that was on the screen. Didn't mention the word Germans. It was the enemy. The man was a member of the New World Order movie-making crowd. This is not to diminish the power of the film. It was very inspirational, only if you knew the backstory and if you knew it was the good guys who won and the bad guys who lost. I felt like cheering at the end, by the way, when the boys were saved. 338,000 British were stranded on that beach waiting for evacuation. You see, they had lost the Battle of France. 
The Battle of France had been lost, by the way, and the Germans had surrounded them on the beaches and the harbor of Dunkirk in the north of France between May 26th and June 4th, 1940, during World War II. British, French, Belgian, and Canadian troops cut off, surrounded by Germans during the Battle of France. Now, it was a colossal military disaster. The entire British Army had been stranded at Dunkirk, and it would have been captured or assassinated had they not been rescued on that beach. It's a miracle, by the way, how this worked out. And the story is told through several storylines, including one that of a simple Brit who has a little pleasure boat, one of the thousands that went out from Dover or other beaches or ports in England in a flotilla to rescue the boys on the beach of Dunkirk. It's told through his eyes, this old man and his boat, going across the treacherous sea to rescue the boys on the beach of Dunkirk with his own son and a son's friend that was 17 years old. And the story is told through his eyes, the eyes of the boys. Great storytelling. Great, great storytelling and very touching at that. Again, we're talking uh, not only about the movie, but about inspired leadership, which is sorely lacking in the West. You know, I heard the Kushner speech. I have nothing good to say about it. Let me put it to you that way. I had sent an email to the few people I communicate with, and I said, he should not speak. I'm sorry he shouldn't have spoken today. As far as the speech itself, the writing of it was written well by the lawyers. It was the cover is back. I think he threw the president's son under the bus, frankly. He immediately detached himself from Donald Jr., incidentally. Incidentally, by the way, you want me to get down and dirty with you? I'll get down and dirty with you. I mean, I got a lot to lose in this situation in some way. This is a harder topic for me than for anyone in radio. I am more closely attached to Trump at the hip than anyone in radio. Let's be very clear. A lot of the Johnny-come-latelys ridiculed him, called you Trumpsters, Trumpeteers, Trumpettes, until they saw which way the wind was blowing, then they became great boosters of Trump. Others did not support him, and they admit it. I did support him for over a year straight. I had him on the show for five years straight. But you have to understand something. I supported his ideas. The ideas, the ideas, the ideas of borders, language, and culture as spelled out in the body of my work over all these years. I didn't necessarily support the man. I supported the ideas. Do you understand that? Now, right now, we're only worried about the man, not about his ideas. And many of you can't understand that when I get upset with he or his entourage... I'm upset because they're taking us away from the ideas that launched his presidency. He was made president not because we loved his suits. He was made president because we loved his ideas. And as I pointed out in an article which appeared last week, 12 hours on the Drudge Report or 18 hours, it was read worldwide, I had an awful lot to do with his presidency. And I'm very proud of that, and I still am, and I will be for the next three and a half well, I don't know how long, maybe seven and a half years, however long it lasts. And I hope that he grows into the job, and I hope that we come to accept him more, and I hope that he starts to become more presidential and stop listening to talk show hosts who are advising him wrongly, in my opinion. Now, as far as Kushner's speech, he said something that I found interesting. He said Trump ran a smarter campaign, and, he's suggesting, and if you suggest otherwise, you're ridiculing those who voted for him. That's my line. Do you remember when I said that to you on this show? by attacking the ideas of Trump and saying he didn't deserve to win every time Maxine Waters attacked him. I said she's attacking us. Do you remember that? So there's a lot of overlap here. And Jared didn't do himself any favor for a couple of reasons. He doesn't have the voice for leadership. He doesn't have the charisma for leadership. And I would have advised that he not come out in public. We didn't need to see him. Why do we need to see this guy? Did you vote for Jared Kushner? I want to ask you. So I'm going to ask you another question, which is embarrassing. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, a heck of a speech by Trump's son-in-law Kushner. I'll just summarize it for you in a nutshell. I was offended when he turned his back and walked away from the press like he was President John F. Kennedy. He does not have the right to turn his back on the press. I am sorry. Moreover, I'll tell you something else. Kushner made an error by giving that speech. We did not have to see him. We did not have to hear him. He spoke to the Senate behind closed doors. Okay, fine, that's their game. He did not have to give this speech. Why did he give this speech? To me, it looks like I'm not guilty, so I'll give you a speech telling you I'm not guilty. Sorry, didn't work for me. 
That doesn't mean he is guilty because there's nothing there. But all he did was make it look bad, period, end of story. If you had known while Trump was running that he was going to make his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, the most prominent member of his team, would you have voted for Trump? Probably. What was the choice? The opposition was so horrible that we would have voted anyway. But I didn't vote for Jared Kushner. I'm not a supporter of metropolitan liberalism, to be honest with you. When I was 18 years old, I was a metropolitan and a liberal. I was a social worker. I've told you that before. But as I grew up, I became a, a different man. In other words, I became a man, and I saw the world for what it was. It began while I was a social worker on Manhattan's Upper West Side, when I saw the abuses of the welfare system, when I saw that the welfare recipients were living better than I was as a young college graduate, giving them the checks to buy things. That's when I started to awaken to the devastation of social liberalism. Uh, and there were other, uh, let us say, crosses along uh, the trail that awakened me finally to what reality is, the reality of our politics. And I could tie this right back to the movie Dunkirk. Dunkirk was about what? It was about the capitulation, the surrender essence of an, in essence of an army. Luckily, they were all saved to fight another day. But right now, the world is at war again. It is not necessarily with bombs and bullets, although sometimes it is. It's at war with the ideas of invasion. Europe has been invaded, as you know, by foreigners who do not want to assimilate. As hard as that is for you to understand, they will never, ever assimilate. And for the European leaders like Merkel and those in Sweden, so horribly naive, ignorant, myopic, and foolish to ignore 1,400 years of the history of Islamic conquest is astounding that the people themselves don't rise up, that they don't see the, su the supremacy of the invaders. Look at where Muslims have occupied a nation. Have they ever accepted secular democracy? Have they ever accepted religious pluralism? Have they ever assimilated into Western societies? Have they? Tell me where. Well, that's what's going on. The surreal world of Europe, where Merkel is now invading her own nation in a sort of perverse way, in a sort of perverse way, just as Hitler invaded surrounding nations to conquer them, Merkel is invading her own nation to conquer it. She has some kind of thing against the patriarchy, I think, and against Christianity itself. But that's a topic for another time. The world is today on the brink, as I see it, the Western world, civilization is on the verge of collapsing. I know you may laugh at that. If you look at the rape epidemic in Sweden, if you look at the capitulation of the Swedes to the invasion of the Islamo-fascist, you will understand what I am talking about. If you would look, if you will look at the invasion, the Islamo-fascist invasion of Europe, you will know what I am talking about. If you will look at the capitulation of Europe to the invasion, you will know what I am talking about. If you will watch the movie Dunkirk, you will understand that we do not have a leader to unite us against this great threat. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. The Savage Nation. We're talking about the movie Dunkirk and what it means today with regard to the invasion of Europe and of Western civilization, which is in many ways crumbling. If you look at Sweden, where they are using clowns to integrate Muslims, you'll say this can't be. There was a great article in Front Page magazine by Bruce Bauer, The Surreal World of Sweden's New Migration Policy, Improving Muslim Integration, Sending in the Clowns. And they said what follows is not a joke. They say that thanks to the astronomical cost of feeding, housing, and clothing immigrants who choose not to, to support themselves, and the equally formidable expense of policing those multiculturally enriched high-crime areas that the authorities haven't already given up on policing, Sweden is bleeding cash. And as a result, there are major cutbacks and outlays for schooling, health care, and the benefits for the elderly of the Swedish people themselves. But nevertheless, the Swedish Migration Board managed to find an unspecified amount of kroner, that's the currency, in the millions 
to spend on the services of an organization called Clowns Without Borders. Clown Utan Granser. Clowns Without Borders. And they plan to teach Muslims to play their way to better integration. The clowns will be used to integrate non-EU immigrants, which means Muslims and Africans. This is hard to believe. And I'm not being cynical. But this is what's going on in the West. Instead of resisting the invasion, instead of forcing them to assimilate to their culture, their civilization, they're capitulating through clownishness. All right, so... Look, we're talking about the news of the day, and I, you know, my show's known on the Savage Nation. I'm known for news, views, and reviews. Okay, news anyone can do. Views anyone can do. Reviews are hard to do. I'm doing a review of Dunkirk, and I'm going to do a review of another movie today, Free State of Jones, that I love with Matthew McConaughey. Is that his name? I don't know how to pronounce it. He's a great actor, but it depicts the horrors of slavery in a way I've not seen it. And, of course, slavery is perhaps the worst thing that could happen to a human being short of being tortured to death or raped. I don't know anything worse, but the the uh, capturing and enslaving of a human being is perhaps the worst thing that could be done to a human being. There's nothing worse to steal a man's freedom. And when you think about it, all of us in some ways are fighting for our freedom every day, whether it's at work. Ultimately, we're fighting for freedom within our own psyche. That's the truth of the matter, and I don't want to get too philosophical or theosophical about it, but... The truth is, that's what the religion is all about, is freedom versus slavery. Are we enslaved by our desires, or, or are we truly free men? That's the bigger picture of the word, of the issue of slavery right now. Are we enslaved by our politics, whether we be on the right or on the left? Or are we free men, able to actually think on our own? Are we enslaved by our narcissism? Are we enslaved by our own egos? Are we enslaved by our own pride? These are the issues of the day. And unfortunately, I think most of us fall short on that question. In essence, we're acting like enslaved people. We're enslaved by our narcissism. We're enslaved by our egos. We're enslaved by our pride. All of these things, these, these issues that plague us. Again, maybe it's too much for an AM show. Who knows? But it's what I do. And as I say, if you have a Van Gogh, you don't put it in the basement. And these ideas are like the ideas that I would like to talk about. They're the Van Goghs and the Rembrandts of the mind. And I'd rather talk about them than about, you know, Democrats bad, Republicans good. I'll do that as well. I'm bored of it, frankly. Savage. This is the Savage Nation. We're talking about a number of topics. Mueller's dream team, Fox News just published all the lawyers who he has hired, who gave dollars to Hillary, now investigating Trump. My opinion, Mr. President, fire Mueller. He's a political hack. The American people will be behind you. Don't worry about the fake press. This is the Savage Nation. Now let's begin with inspiration. Today we're going to also talk about inspired leadership and inspirational speeches by great leaders like Winston Churchill, whose name, by the way, was left out of the movie Dunkirk because the uh, director didn't want anyone to be offended by Winston Churchill or, let's say, Britain itself. It was astounding, and he turned it into just an action movie like Batman and a very good action movie. I mean, you get to see what it was like as close as you can in a movie theater to what it would be like drowning on a, on a ship that's being bombed from above or being strafed on a beach by the Nazis. But aside from that, you didn't know who was shooting who. So we're going to go now to the great speech by the man who inspired a nation. He was the man who pulled the nation together in their darkest moment. He was the great conservative who had been put on ice in the 1930s by the Labour uh, Party in England. They didn't want anything to do with his right-wing views. While he was warning them about Nazi Germany rearming, they said he was a right-wing maniac. They said he was a fascist. They said he was a danger. It was Winston Churchill who started the program to build a British Spitfire, which saved Britain in the Battle of Britain. It was Winston Churchill who rearmed Britain in the 1930s when they called him a fascist for being pro-military. Again, the liberals, had they been listened to, there'd be no England, they'd be speaking German, and the others who were not British would be lampshades. I still pray for a Churchillian figure in the United States of America, and other than on talk radio, they don't exist. Somehow, politics doesn't seem to attract this type of personality. 
And I guess what I'm saying here is Donald Trump should get off Twitter. I'll say it over and over again until finally he stops and get behind the Oval Office, stand in the Oval Office with the lectern with the United States seal of the presidency and occasionally give a speech to America to unite us and inspire us. That is what I'm waiting for. He could do it, by the way. He has the charisma and he has the voice. What he doesn't have is the guidance. What he doesn't have is the advisors. I, as an outside advisor, am saying, Mr. Trump, get behind the lectern of the Oval Office and unite America before it is too late. You can do it. You have the power, you have the charisma, and you have the voice. Uh, and by the way, study the Churchill speeches over and over and over again before you do so. Interestingly enough, when I took Speech 101 at Queens College in New York, that's a long time ago, I was 16 years old, and I was an immigrant son in New York, and I, I was a little embarrassed by my speech, to be honest with you, because I did not speak what is known or was known as the King's English. I had inherently a great voice. I was gifted with that. But as a kid, I just didn't have the ability to speak that well in front of crowds, at least as well as I would like to have. And I took Speech 101, and one of the speeches we listened to over and over again in Queens College, and the speech teacher was great, was Winston Churchill, another one was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and by the way, the teacher was not political, I don't remember him talking about their politics, he was showing us what great speeches were, and he made us listen to their cadence, their diction, their inflection, their timing, their pauses, well I guess I learned something uh, from Speech 101 at Queens College when I was 16 years old, and here I am so many years later speaking to America and in many ways trying to inspire you and I would like today to tell you that although the Battle of Britain is long over and the British won and the Nazis went down into defeat, thank God, I look back and although I, I despised Obama's policies, I despised his divisiveness, I at the time said, and it took me a while to say this, it took me a couple of years, he was the greatest left-wing propagandist I have ever seen in my life. He was a genius at public relations. I'm talking about Obama. He could sell communism to a nation that never embraced it. He could sell racism to a nation that rejected it. He could sell division to a nation that didn't want it. And he did so on a daily basis and was never, ever attacked for it by the Wolf Blitzers and the Jake Tappers, ever. And so now we come to a new president. And we ask the president to get in front of the cameras again. We ask the president to become Churchillian and not Twitter anymore. I doubt very much that he will listen to me. I think he's listening to someone else in the media who is misadvising him badly. Yes, his popularity is at 50% amongst those who voted for him. I know that. But if you're not going to accept the fact that the nation is divided and as president try to unite it, then you're not going to be a good leader. It's that simple. The president has an obligation to bring us together, not only to speak to those who voted for him. And this is a problem that Obama was guilty of as well. Obama spoke only to his left-wing base. He never, ever addressed those of us who, uh, well, I say deplored his viewpoints. That's why they called us the deplorables during the Hillary Clinton years uh, campaign. We deplored Obama's divisiveness. And then we became the deplorables to them. But he never, ever addressed our concerns, our fears, our wants, our, our dreams. He only directed his speeches to his base. Well, Hillary tried the same thing, and she lost. She lost by a hair. We can argue over whether she won or lost. We can argue over the illegal aliens voting. We can argue over a lot of things. But she lost because she didn't have a good net message. And that is because she spoke only to her base. Trump is making the same error. He's speaking only to his base. He is using the same vitriol he used during the campaign. And it's not working except for his base. He needs to step out of the campaign mode and into the leadership mode. It's sad that the country has now devolved to a big lie within a big lie within a bigger lie in a box of big lies created by Hillary Clinton's campaign of liars. Welcome to the Savage Nation. But having said that, Kushner made a big error today, in my opinion, by speaking at all. I really didn't want to hear him speak. And also, you know, when I hear someone say I did not do something publicly, I immediately assume they did. For some weird reason, when he said I did not 
have collusion with that woman. I, I'm sorry. Uh, I know he didn't because there was nothing there, I guess. But why did he have to say that? There was no need for this. Moreover, he's not a very appealing speaker. We were talking today about uh, <laughs> inspiration, speeches, inspirational speeches, and I compared the speeches of Churchill in the movie Dunkirk, which I saw last night, with the sad lack of leadership and inspiration that we have today. Uh, sadly, Kushner is not an inspiring speaker. Probably a good person, uh, a fine businessman and a great husband and father and a wonderful son-in-law, but that's really not my business. I have no idea why he decided who advised him to get up there in public. And I'll ask you, the, li the listener, to be the jury, the judge and the jury here, on a very simple note. Did Trump's son-in-law, Kushner, today, did the speech he gave help or hurt him? Did it help him? Or hurt him. The government has gotten bigger, not smaller. The spending is bigger, not smaller. The trade deficit is bigger, not smaller. What would you like me to do? Make believe all is well? I don't work for Fox News. I'm not a cheerleader for the Trump administration. I consider myself a supporter. I consider myself a great supporter of Donald Trump. But he has to fight the real issues, not the petty issues. He's got to forget the idiots in the media he doesn't like and, and ignore them. If I were to start getting angry at everyone who puts me down on radio or television or tweeting, I wouldn't have time to do my important work. It's very easy to lose the forest for the trees, President Trump. I've been in the media long enough to know that there's always going to be backstabbers, jealous people, phonies, and you can't spend your whole life talking about them because you'll never get anything done. It's part of the job of putting up with the losers and the copycats and the fakers. I want to talk about the election that's coming up for a minute. There's a jerk named Kid Rock. Some jerk, a rock musician. Everyone's running for the office now. One muscle-bound actor and now a Kid Rock. One r Kid Rock uh, is running for Senate. And then you got an actor who has muscles running for the presidency. I'll tell you what's going to happen right now. Many of them think that because of the Trump phenomenon, anyone can get elected. Many of these jerks, these celebrity jerks, believe that because Donald Trump is only a celebrity and that he got elected, they could run and win too. Well, it may happen in some cases, but I doubt very much it'll ever happen again at the presidency level. It'll never happen again. That's number one. What they also don't understand is that Trump had a very, very powerful message that mobilized millions of people who ordinarily would not vote for anyone. And that message was designed by me in Government Zero, in Stop the Coming Civil War, and in numerous books before that. And one of his newly found geniuses took all of my best ideas, the solutions from those books, and put them on a whiteboard in the Oval Office and started to make believe he was the one who wrote them when no one ever heard of him before, uh, three months before the president's uh, election. Three months before the campaign, this character was never heard from. No one knew who he was. He was an obscure website operator. So he took my ideas and gave them to Donald Trump. Donald Trump sold them to the American people because they're good ideas. They're ideas built on nationalism. And the people loved it. That is, the people who voted for Donald Trump loved the, the ideas of nationalism. And so when you get these schmendricks in, in, in the celebrity world who think they can be president because they got a good build or they got a this, or they can sing a song, and they got adulating fans, they're mistaken. They have no message. What's their message? What are they going to sell? Tell me what the message is going to be from some muscle-bound schmuck from Hollywood. What's his message? Let's say some actor who makes far too much money and is very popular runs for office. Why would anyone vote for him? What's his message? What's he going to do that we haven't heard before? Let's see. Uh, more health care for the world. No, we can't afford it. We're going to tackle the greatest crisis the world has ever seen. Global warming, burr. That's come and gone. The data doesn't support it. Uh, we're going to give gays and lesbians more rights. Uh, we've heard that before. That's an old one. It's been used for 20 years. Oh, transgenders, more of them. That's not going to work. The average person doesn't care. So what's their platform going to be? Tax the rich, screw the rich, kill the rich, eat the rich. That might work. Try that for a while. While they're one of the richest people on the earth. How would that work? If some schmuck from Hollywood gets them, oh, the rich, tax the rich, and look at them, what? 
Leon DiCaprio is going to talk about tax the rich. So I don't think they can win. And I'll tell you something else, just a little side note here. This Trump phenomenon is a one-time shot. This is a one-time exploration, experiment, if you want to put it that way, with an outsider. And because of the problems that we're all having, it's never going to happen again. Be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. I don't want to drone on and on about the movie Dunkirk, but I know it's going to be a very big hit over the next few days and weeks, and you're going to see it. And you got to remember, it's historical, it's, it's revisionism. They don't show the word Nazi. They don't show the word German. They call them the enemy. You only see the swastika on the ME-109 briefly. Uh, you barely see the Union Jack anywhere, so you don't even know who's fighting. And the director is a universalist, New World Order type, brilliant storyteller, and it's worth going to if you know the story of Dunkirk. However, I I'll give you some warning. Do not bring children to this movie. You may think, oh, it's inspiring, and my kid will want to join the military. He'll be patriotic. He may not. Your son or daughter might get very scared watching this movie because the sound effects are overwhelming to an adult who has seen thousands of hours of war movies, thousands of hours of documentaries on World War II. If you sit in the theater with a great sound system, the sound will scare this child because it's the sound of the plane buzzing overhead. It's the sound of a sinking ship. It's the sound of men drowning. If, believe it or not, there is a sound of men drowning. Uh, there's the sound of bullets going through the hull of an iron ship, threatening the men inside. The music score is Academy Award level. Everything about it is overwhelming to the mind and, and to the soul. I wouldn't bring a child to that. I really wanted to talk about freedom and slavery today by launching uh, into the story behind the movie, The Free State of Jones. It's a new film that came out last year with Matthew McConaughey, who plays Confederate soldier Newton Knight. Now, you may see him as a hero or a traitor, depending upon how you see the Civil War. However... It's a great movie, and I caught it by accident on Saturday watching TV. I had a lot of time on my hands. I was reading, watching TV, and I read a book I also wanted to talk about that I may get to this week, uh, entitled uh, The Day of the Locust. It's a very pro poignant story written in the 1930s about the, uh, let's say, the lower echelon of Hollywood and the mass mentality of Hollywood. Boy, was that a book. I wish I had it in front of me now. I'd write, read you some of the quotes from that one, The Day of the Locust by Nathaniel West. In many ways, Nathaniel West as a writer is similar to what I am as a talk show host. Savage.